James, uh, what is the central work of our lives? The, um, of course, there's lots of ways of talking about that, but I, I think the main job that all of us have, regardless of our profession, regardless of where in the world we, we are, is to find out and live from the deep mystery of who each of us is, taking on the project of unfolding who we are, taking on in our, all of our conversations and all of our work projects and all our relationships, unfolding the kind of person that we intend to be or that we've been given to be. The, part of the idea, Fred, is that, at least the, the way I have it, you know, we'll hear what, how you see it in a second, is that life is a gift to us, but our idea, of, my idea is not to hold on to the gift, but the gift is to give. You know, as you, you say in your book, uh, in business, is about service. Mm. Same thing. But, what kind of, but I have a particular kind of service that only I can bring. That's the uniqueness of, of the life that's been given to me that's a combination of how I lived in my family, my genetic makeup, the time and place, all of that. So instead of leaving that to chance, we can intentionally engage in a life that turns us into the kind of person that lets us deliver the gift that we've been given. So I, that's what I think is the central task. And what, I mean, you've been teaching coaching, uh, you've co coached and teach, taught coaching for many years, so what, what, what's the role of coaching in that? work? I think that's uh, the, beginning, the beginning and the middle and the end of coaching is that. Hmm. So, so coaching starts with this meeting of someone and not meeting them as a client or meeting them as somebody with a collection of problems or somebody who is going to help our bank account, but meeting them as a unique being with openness and freshness so they have a chance to, in our by looking at how we're relating to them, find a new part of themselves. Mm. You were, we were speaking before about legitimizing right. that search for people. I, I loved the, 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 what yeah, you that said was, that was, before. Yes, this, uh, this was from, uh, from King Lear, that the, uh, most of us have a big challenge about what makes me legitimate. How do I get my legitimacy? Mm. And uh, I thought you said it in a really nice way when we were talking before that uh, most of us get our legitimacy from I please you. And certainly at work, I have, I'm legitimate if I please my customers and I please my boss and you know, I guess there's sometimes I have to please my team. But I have, my legitimacy is always conferred by other people, which means pretty much I have to abandon myself or, can, or abandon this, this deep mystery that I am and instead seek it from outside. So I think part of what, and this is, thanks for asking that, because it gives this chance to say this other part about coaching, is the coaching relationship is meeting the person as totally legitimate already. There's nothing that they have to do. There's not a way that they have to perform. There's not a, a, the right answer to questions. There's not a right way they are supposed to be. Hmm. But in and of themselves, they are legitimate. And for so many people, as you know, they've never met anyone who meets them as legitimate. Sometimes even our parents, unfortunately, have a role that we're supposed to fulfill and we are not legitimate unless we do that, unless we get the right grades or we're cute or good in sports or something like that. Hmm. But what, what, how would you say it? How would you say what is the, the main work of a person's well, when life? Well, you, when you proposed that we would have to give a talk with, with that title, I was wondering, you know, what would I say? What, what's the central job in our lives? And, I mean, what came to me was to be really happy. Like that, that's the most difficult work, to be really happy. But not really happy as opposed to really unhappy, but, but really happy as opposed to unreally happy. Right. <laughs> because, because it's so tempting to be happy about unreal things. It's like, uh, you know, drugs are great and they make you feel great for a while. Yes. And, and then you want more, uh, and, and then you feel unhappy about them. Or, or the happiness that they provide is, is somewhat not full spectrum. It's just a, a very narrow slice of right, happiness. Right. And we all agree, I mean, most people would agree that, that you know, that's not the only way to fly. But the, 
the, the central job in our lives is to learn how to be happy in reality, like to, to experience reality in a way that is profoundly satisfying, profoundly fulfilling, just as it is. And yet, just as it is includes the impulse to improve it. Right. So everything is perfect and it can be even better. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, um, I love that part of our conversation that we've been having that um, reality is what we make friends with rather than reality is what we flee from or that we try to uh, conquer. Exactly. By being smarter than it or richer than it or something. But you know, when I, when I work with, with executives or, or people in business or coaching, they, they always come with, I don't like this. There, right. there's, something, there's something wrong. And, and it's, it's natural, you know, just like the Buddha said, every teaching starts with suffering because suffering is the, the, the appearance of the desire to have things be different. So I am unhappy and I want to be happy, but then the temptation comes to find some placebo, to find something that will make me happy quickly, like I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to solve this problem, and when I solve this problem, then I'll be happy. Right. And when I get the promotion, I'll be happy, and when I get uh, you know, the, the, the corner office, I'll be happy, or whatever, the new computer, or whatever it is. And then I get it, and, and I'm not happy, and I want something else. But there's, there's always a, a new desire that springs up with the illusion that once I get that, I'm going to be happy. Right, and, um, and we both know from our work with, with, with people that that going after requires me to get really narrow. Exactly. So I want to be the executive vice president, well, so much for my children, so much for my relationships, so much for my, my health, so much for any other interests, so much for learning anything new. Let me put in my 80 hours and get that. And then I'm surprised that when I get it, I'm not satisfied. Well, there's hardly any of me left. <laughs> by the time I get there. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, uh, that's the <laughs> that's worst. That's a technical way of saying <laughs> it, yes. <laughs> thank you for that. That's, well, that's, a, that's the worst part summary, of it. Yes. That's, I mean, it's like, you know, you, 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 you're afraid you're not going to get it, and then you're miserable because you're not going to get it, and then when you get it, it sucks. It, 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 it's it's right. terrible. So well, what, I, what I found is that the real work in our lives is it's a little bit like Charlie Brown when, when he, you know, Lucy puts the ball and says, okay, this time it's going to be different. Yes, yes. You know, I, I won't take it out. I just, right, just right. go ahead. And, and, you know, he never learns that it's always going to... That is the amazing thing. 10,000 times and we don't learn. Yes. Like you said, we, we have a list of, oh, if I get this, I'll be happy, even though I got the last 10 things I was after and I'm still not happy or fulfilled or I'm still not at home with myself. This is the real one. Yes. There's something about games that I think is, is quite profound about that, which in a game, like if you think of chess, yeah. you play chess and it, in the board, it's life and death. It's all consuming, it's all important. When you step out, it's just a game. And that's what allows you to enjoy, because if it was really life and death, you couldn't enjoy right. it. So I find that this stereo vision, seeing both things, that on the one hand, what, what I'm doing is really important and meaningful and matters and I feel passionate about it. Like, I'm inside the game and it's, it's all there is. And on the other hand, it's just a game. And that, that combination, I, I find that that's what allows me and the people I, I work with to be really happy. That, that it's possible to be fully committed, fully passionate, and at the same time, to have an attitude of equanimity about right. what's happening. Right. That my legitimacy doesn't come from how well I'm playing the game. I can win on a given day, I can lose on a given day, I can learn something new, I can make my old mistakes, but still I'm legitimate. And the game is not determining my identity. I'm bringing myself to the game rather than trying to get who I am from the game. I'd say, I mean, I agree with that, but I would add something that how I play the game, for me, it's very meaningful, but not how the game ends. It's a little bit like the Bhagavad Gita, right. and what matters is the values you express while you play the game, not whether you win or lose. Winning or losing is, is conditional. It depends on the other player, depends on external conditions. I mean, all sorts of things can happen out of control. And as Arjuna learns from, from, from his teacher, the you have a right to the action. 
not the consequences of the action. That's what Krishna teaches him. Right. So when you're playing, you have the right to play with integrity, to play with honor, to play with wisdom and compassion. Not, that doesn't determine that you win, but it does determine that that's the central work. We are becoming who we are as a work of art. That's the wisdom in the expression yes, of the work. That's right, exactly. And, um, it, and I don't know, you know, you're from Argentina, I don't know how deep that is in Argentinian psyche, but in America, we think that if we are really good and true to ourself, that we're gonna win. <laughs> no, well, that, that, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Because then, then, then it means no. if I don't win, there's something wrong with me. Exactly. Well, I remember, I mean, this was, this was a very painful personal experience. Uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, I, was, I was very good friends with, with a guy who, his father was, was dying of cancer. Oh, yeah. But nobody wanted to tell the father. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so he never knew he was dying of cancer. But worse yet, nobody wanted to tell the kids. I mean, the, the, there were other kids in the family and the little right. kids. And they were a religious family in Argentina. Uh, it's a very Catholic country. So they were telling all the time to the kids, pray to little Jesus. You know, pray to little Jesus so grandpa gets, uh, you know, gets well. And, you know, grandpa died. And guess what the kids were saying? So wh why is little Jesus so mean? Why did he kill grandpa? Right. I mean, but, but that's the illusion that if you do everything well, you will be rewarded and you win. I mean, it's terrible because then you're either resentful with the universe right. or you feel you did something wrong. So right. it's, it's a guilt trip either way. Exactly. So this, this uh, shift that uh, instead of reality being something for us to overcome, reality being something that we can cooperate with, harmonize with, find out about, and take whatever circumstances happen as a chance for me to practice unfolding the kind of person that I, that I am. Yes. Well, that, that's the beauty of the challenges that they allow you to express truly what you're here to do. I mean, as you were saying, how to unfold that mysterious being that wants to blossom from within. But, you know, there's, there's a phrase in English that I love. It says, I'm not just a fair weather sailor. So if, if I want to show that I'm not just a fair weather sailor, well, I need a freaking storm. I mean, I want, I want, I want bad weather, although, you know, when, the, when my mind goes like, oh, shit, my soul is saying, oh, fertilizer. Yes, because exactly right. That's like, that's like the good stuff. You know, I'm gonna, I can, I can express the truth right. in the midst of the most difficult situations. But that's really what happens in corporations all the all time. All the time, right. I mean, there's, it's always stormy in the corporations. I mean, yes. shit is going on all the time. Right. And we could either think of that as a series of failures or a ser series of troubles or a series of breakdowns, or what we're proposing here is it's the chance to practice. It's the chance to find out, well, how much truth am I going to say here? Yes. How much am I going to withhold? How much am I going to make myself into a presentation? How much am I going to make myself caught into a brand? Yes. Or how much am I going to be the unique somebody that, that I am? And there's there's a million chances per month to practice that. Absolutely. Well, I mean, yesterday I was working with an executive and he was telling me, you know, I, I really, I'm very dissatisfied with, with the performance of one of my team members, right. but I don't want to tell her because she's going to be demotivated. So again, it's, it's the, you know, this, this desire, since I know that I'm happy when I get things right, right. I don't want to make other people unhappy, so I'd rather be... <clears throat> I'd rather them be unreally happy or untruthfully happy than truthfully unhappy yeah. if I tell them that I'm not satisfied. And, yeah. and this, this is a social disaster because peop, we all try to protect one another from the truth. And then at some point we burst and the truth comes out in a whole anyway, way. Anyway, right, exactly. The truth doesn't change whether we tell it or not. It's there. Yes, but people... People are, th I mean, we think, at least I, I find myself and other people thinking of the truth in a very aggressive manner. Like, you're doing something wrong. And, and this, this you is so intrusive. Like, you know, like people coming on stage and saying, I'm going to take up the space and tell you yeah. who you are and what you need to do. Right. That's like attacking the privacy of the other person. And very few executives can think, like, you know, I'm, 
this is not working for me, or I, I'm, I would like something more. I like our relationship to be better. Right. So even the performance reviews, when, when they're done, they're like, in the most constructive manner is, I know, I'm the boss, yes. I'm going to tell you what yeah. you're doing wrong and how yeah. to fix it, right. but I'll be nice to you. Yeah, I'll be nice, right. Well, part of it is I want to avoid lawsuits and all that. And sometimes I really do care about the person. So this gives us a chance to talk about the other part that what we uh, got to last night that I so liked, about meeting everybody on equal ground. Exactly. And uh, when we don't, uh, when we withhold the truth from people, we are, in, in a way, demoting them. We're saying, I can handle the truth, but not you. Well, that, that's one of the problems of the so-called sports coaching, that people identify with coaching in business. Yeah. When managers say, okay, I'm going to give you feedback, and then I'll coach you. It's like, Ugh, you know, please know. spare me. Yeah, spare I mean, me it's, it's, it's a horrible, it's like a, a threat. <laughs> I have some feedback for you. It's like, please don't give it to me. I don't want it. Um, or now I'm going to give you some coaching. It's like, ugh. Right. Know. Notice how different it is if, and at least if a person comes and says, um, I, I'd like to make our relationship even better. Or there's something I thought that would make our work together even more successful. But then it's coming from a place of humility. Like, you, you don't work for me. You work for the mission. And I just have the responsibility to help you be more successful in accomplishing the mission that brings us together. Right. But that's a totally different frame that I'm your boss. I mean, I, I don't even get what it means that I'm your boss, but people use it all the time. What happens is we're a team, we're working together, I have some authority, and I have some opinions about what we might do better, right. but I could be wrong. I could be wrong, and you're right, because I'm only seeing it from one point of view. Let's include lots of other points of view. Yes. One of the things that we also... Uh, I think it's good to talk about a boss is sometimes bosses think their job is to give the other person legitimacy. And until you, until I say, yes, Fred, that is correct, then what your view is not legitimate. Yes. But even the, the paradox of empowerment, like I empower you. Yeah. Okay? How it's crazy because, is that? Because I, I'm so powerful that I can empower you. Yes, exactly. And if you... Displease me, I'll disempower That's you, right. so be, watch out. Huh? It's always, there's an on switch and an off switch. Exactly. But, but it, happens, it happens also, when, at least for me, I don't, I'd like to hear your experience. Yeah. When I teach coaches, yeah. they, they want to be so nice that they want to empower their clients, legitimize their clients, like I'm going to, as opposed to, no, as you, I love the way you said, you are already legitimate, I'm meeting you in your yes, legitimacy. Yes, I'm meeting you in your legitimacy, and there's nothing you have to do to prove it or reprove it every, every quarter or every week how, or anything like that. How do you, how do you train your, your, I know in your yeah, school yeah. you have so, lots so of So this students. is how it starts. It starts by, you're such a great person to look at. <laughs> it starts with um, living a life, Fred, so that when I'm sitting across from somebody, I can be quiet mm. enough mm. to meet them and their uniqueness. And then the first, step all the time in our kind of coaching is to find out what is the essential quality that's most beaming out of this person right now. Mm. So for you, you have this really uh, fabulous combination of love, compassion, with uh, wanting to find out what's true together, coming out of you. Mm. I feel very empowered. <laughs> No, but it's, it's, it's exactly, I mean, the way you're doing it, you're meeting me at the level. So yeah. I, I feel that. I, I don't right. feel you're talking down to me. No, but, but it's, it's, right. It's, it's like meeting me and looking for something to appreciate. Sometimes, yes, right. You know, you have to look really hard, but, but sooner or later <laughs> you find something. You can appreciate in everybody. <laughs> I, I, I take it the other way, which is if I can't find it in the person, it's my... Prejudice. Exactly, yes. I've been practicing with, uh, you know, like you, I'm on planes a lot. So I've been practicing with flight attendants mm. as they're walking down the aisle. What's the positive essential quality of this person? Mm. Even though they're busy. And you know, sometimes they are they're actually there talking to you, and other times they're mm. uh, resentful that they're there or preoccupied. But I find that it, in a way it doesn't matter what state the other person's in. If I can quiet my own... Uh, critical mind enough, mm. it's beaming. People yes. are, well, you know, when we meet reality, reality is shining. Yes. And but people especially. What a beautiful thing to do that with, with people at work. Yeah. 
to, to, to look for the opportunity to recognize the life that shines behind everybody. And, um, and I work at LinkedIn, and one of the things that people take very seriously there is trying to integrate excellence and compassion. Oh, beautiful. Because that's, you know, Jeff talks a lot about that, and I've been talking with Jeff about that for, for many, many years. But the, it's kind of a challenge because people think demanding excellence can be ruthless because it, it's uncompassionate. It's like, you right. know, if you're not meeting the standard. But one of the things that I'm, I've been pondering lately is these expanding circles of care and compassion. Right. And demanding excellence, in a way, is compassion for all the unseen. I mean, it's, it's like, I want, I want to demand excellence of us, so when we speak, people can, right. can get a, a better sense of who they are. And I want my colleagues at LinkedIn to, to be excellent, because we are 7,000 people serving hundreds of millions. Right. And it, it's, not, it's not an opportunity to do a job, but it's the opportunity to serve all these uh, invisible people, so loving people that we don't even see. That, that's kind of the appreciation in a personal way, but as the Buddha would say, you know, to all sentient beings, even all the flight attendants you don't see. Right, like, can exactly. we appreciate them too? Right, right. And um, that even if I'm meeting a flight attendant, in that way, just for a second while she's you know, bringing me my glass of water. That will pass to however many people she's with on the yes. plane. That will pass, maybe somebody will go home and be nicer to their spouse or their child because of that. So it's always, one of the ways we say it in our school is, yes, I'm training you to be a coach, but I'm working for your clients all the time. I'm not yes. working for you. Yes. So that's why I'm asking you to use your word for excellence, why I'm asking you to please be um, rigorous with yourself, please pay attention. This isn't just for you. Exactly. But that would be a, such a different way to do our business. You know that when you're working with someone, the demand for excellence is not simply as a, I eat, you're not a resource for me. Right. But you and I are in a loving relationship to expand this to all the people that depend on us this to is, grow. This is why I'm so happy that uh, you know, the, the gods of uh, Wisdom 2.0 put us together so we could say, you know, because I'm so happy that you say that because I, I, it's so true that what we're doing is way bigger than um, we made the number or we didn't make the number. You're good because you helped me make the number. You got in the way. Let's get rid of you. Bring someone, someone else in. I, because even as you would say, I, I think too, that that way of looking at, at it, you can't get a successful business. It's too small. It, it, it narrows people down. It has people not tell you the truth because they don't want to be on the, the bad list of, of people. Yes. But if we are serving the hundreds of millions of people or of LinkedIn or we're serving you know, the, you know, the 20 people that come to my convenience store every day, same, doesn't yes. matter how, it doesn't matter the size, then we are... Um, Treating each other as being humans, you know, the, not the I, it, but the, the, the I, thou, as Uber yes. would say, both legitimate. Well, one of the big paradoxes in business is that the, the, the one way that you will surely not be profitable is by having the mission of your company make money. Like when you say, our mission is to make money, that will kill your company. Right. I mean, there's no way that you will ever succeed like that. But similarly, the banner of an unhappy life is, I just want to be happy. I yes. want to be happy. It's, it's all for me. I, yes. I want to be happy. And paradoxically, then, then you're miserable. You're not happy like that. Right. I, I mean, I once heard the Dalai Lama said, the problem is not selfishness. The problem is idiocy. Right. So <laughs> if, you, if, you want to be a, if you want to be selfish, don't be an idiot. Be, be intelligent. Exactly. So what, what makes you happy is love, service, connection, meaning in your life, well, go for it. I mean, be greedy about the right things, not, not, not this little ego thing. In a company, it could be the little profit thing. But paradoxically, when you expand and you try to be of service and you have this ethical concern for behaving properly and serving the larger community, then you make a ton of money. So I, I, don't see, I, I really don't see the paradox when you go beyond the the smallness of the ego. Right. Well, the, the idiocy, and well, we, we only have 30 seconds to uh, condemn the whole uh, educational system of the West. More than enough. Yeah, more than enough. 
because the, the educational system of the West is all that. It's all um, get what you want, get the, get the number. Yes. Uh, conform, do what you're told, work yeah. harder. Yeah, it's a prison and a factory put together to get people to comply with the fiction of reality. But, you know, I love, for me, coaching is giving people the red pill. It's right. Like, yeah. You, exactly. You, you choose the red pill and then you stay in Wonderland and you see how deep the rabbit hole goes. <laughs>